Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larson with Behind the Schemes, and in this episode we're talking about tackling wildlife crime in Vietnam. Southeast Asian countries such as Vietnam are facing significant challenges when it comes to dealing with the illegal wildlife trade. A major factor is the continued use of endangered species in traditional Chinese medicine. Vietnam's last rhino was killed for her horn in 2010, and this unique subspecies of Javan rhino is now extinct. Today, bears and tigers are still held captive in Vietnam in horrific conditions to supply an illegal yet lucrative market for bear bile and tiger parts. Quinn Vu, founder of Education for Nature Vietnam, tells us how her team is rising to the challenge of protecting the country's wildlife by working with both the public and the authorities. We must warn you that the video version of this episode contains extremely disturbing undercover footage of a bear bile extraction. Education for Nature Vietnam is Vietnamese first environmental NGOs in Vietnam. And initially we focus on raising awareness among Vietnamese people about the importance of protecting nature and wildlife. Why, why we recognize that environmental education is important, we feel that we still witness a lot of wildlife cross the border every day to China and other countries. So we, uh, we, we feel that we need to take much more stronger measures to address uh, the problem facing wildlife in Vietnam. And so uh, by 2005, we developed those, those strategies to uh, to, to combat the illegal wildlife trade in Vietnam by uh, increasing the public involvement and their support in protecting uh, wildlife. We also uh, focus on strengthening the enforcement and uh, improvement of law and, uh, and uh, legislation on wildlife protection. And uh, yeah, so, so far everything uh, going great. Um, we have a lot of public participation. We have uh, more than 3,000 volunteers all over the country uh, who help us to report wildlife and, uh, and carry out uh, uh, compliance monitoring in their local areas. Uh, and thanks to their participation, a lot of wildlife, including critically endangered species like gibbon, uh, langurs, bears, otters, you name it, have been mm-hmm. saved thanks to their participation. And of course, over the past few years, we see a positive trend of, of, of uh, improvement in the law enforcement in Vietnam. So, yeah, it's a great. It's, yeah, that that sounds excellent, um, and that must have been a huge challenge for you because we often are hearing about Southeast Asia being described as the heart of the illegal wildlife trade, and so I was wondering what was it that that inspired you to do this, but also what was it like to start an organization that addresses these issues right there in in Vietnam? Uh, Well, back in 2000s, when um, the the concept of local NGO was very new to Vietnam, and so it was a tough process for myself and my college to establish ENV because ENV was established by young Vietnamese people, um, which was very unusual for Vietnam at that time. And and, and so... uh, what inspired us was that at that time, in, about in 2000, because ENV was established based on, uh, uh, you know, was born out of the Cook Fung Conservation Project uh, in, Cook Fung, uh, in, in uh, Ning Bing province where I work. And, and at that time, also, oh, lot you know, we have a lot of international invo- uh, conservation organizations working in Vietnam to, you know, try to help Vietnam to protect 
uh, wildlife and nature and environment. But at that time, there's very few Vietnamese people working on these issues. And, um, and we feel that yet the role of, of, of international NGOs are very important to Vietnam, but we need a, a solution. You know, we need a Vietnamese solution. We need Vietnamese people, uh, you know, take actions in, in uh, to address these matters. So not just rely on the foreign help mm-hmm. and support. And that's why uh, myself and, and my college went, went off and established NGO, uh, uh, ENB. Oh, fantastic. Did you find that uh, the interest in protecting wildlife and the environment in Vietnam, you were saying that there's a, a lot of young people involved. Is it still mostly young people? Or now that you've been uh, operating for a while, are you finding that older older generations are getting involved with with it as well? Oh, yes, there are older people involved in, 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 in this sort of thing. The increasing number of Vietnamese people caring about nature and wildlife. But I have to say, younger people are more enthusiastic and they take more actions. For example, uh, our volu- national volunteer network attracts more young people than the older people. You know, young people willing to go out and monitor wildlife farms, take risks and, 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 and report wildlife farms. Uh, mm-hmm. To ENV, so yeah, uh, definitely there, there are older people, but older people uh, less active, I would say, than mm-hmm. uh, younger people. Mm-hmm. And and answer your earlier questions about you know uh, what the difficulties we we, we are facing, uh, and of course one the, uh, I think one of the most uh, I would say of you know. One of the, the, the major obstacles for us is in racing against time, mm, because mm-hmm. because even though we see a, a a very positive trend in law enforcement over the past ten years uh, and the increase of public support and involvement in protecting wildlife, but one of our major concerns is what's left. You know, mm, whether mm-hmm. we would have time. Uh, but by the time everybody's ready, every time, uh, by the time that the, that the government really know what they're doing and they're doing their job, you know, we have anything left in nature. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a scary part. Yeah, it is. It is definitely at this point a race against time. Hmm. Yeah. I uh, read an interesting article about ENV's campaign to end something called bear bile tourism. Um, could you tell us what bear bile tourism is and also more about ENV's campaign to end that? Well, bear bile tourism is just a visible part of bear bile industry in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, bear bile tourism usually involved uh, Korean tourists come to Vietnam, specifically to Hot Long area, to, uh, to visit Bear farms here, uh, bear farms there, and and, and buy bear by witness bear by attraction and bear by and bring back to Korea. Uh, but that is just a visible part of the bear mm-hmm. by industry in Vietnam. What ENV has been doing is uh, is that uh, he, as you might know, Vietnam has uh, more than three thousand bears in the captivity at the moment, and they are care to support the bear buy mm. industry in Vietnam. And so what we have been doing is we work with the government to increase law enforcement to uh, prevent new bear coming into the farm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also uh, de- have developed a campaign to uh, aim at reducing the bear buy consumptions in Vietnam, working with with TV, radio, uh, journalists, and um, university uh, carrying a public event and uh, seminars at university to encourage people not to use bear bar. 
And how are the how's the public responding to that? Is it also more young people responding, or are you finding that older people are responding to this campaign as well? Because that's um, the use of bear bile. Uh, in my understanding, is that's pretty uh, a pretty deeply entrenched uh, the cultural tradition. Yes, um, we, we we get a response from all ages. Of- you know, people at own age in Vietnam, mm-hmm. oh, a lot okay. of older people, a lot of people, uh, older people pledge not to use bear bar and oh, get a lot of comments from all range of age. Um, you know, and, and we also uh, have a lot of celebrities like, uh, um, uh, movie stars or, Football players or comedians who are involved in uh, working with us to encourage the fans not to use bear bars in Vietnam. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. that is great. Now, recently, ENV had a success story regarding tiger trade. Can you tell me some more about that? Well, uh, this is the one. Tiger uh, case in um, in, a, in a province in, uh, in the north of Vietnam, where authority wanted to uh, cook up a, a, a confiscated tiger uh, and make it into a tiger bone glue, and what so we we wanted to stop this action because mm-hmm. it set a bad precedent uh, for other provinces in Vietnam. So uh, we contacted them and tried to talk to them out of it, tried to talk to them and say, hey, you need to, um, you can't do that. It's, it's illegal and you also support the tiger trade by doing so. And mm-hmm. of course, they did not listen. Mm-hmm. So we have to choose a, a, a hard way to deal with the issues by uh, getting the public involved. And in this case, specifically, uh, a lot of, we got a lot of interest from journalists who, you know, brought up the issue in, in uh, national and local newspapers and getting the authority of this province to come out and, and, and promise that they would not do that. Uh, they would not uh, auction, they would not, you know, sell and auction off the tiger bone um, glue. So, yeah, and, and, and the case was run on so many channels uh, on the media, on the um, newspapers and TV and radios everywhere in the country. Oh, that's fantastic. Did you find that um, the media attention has uh, made certain actions more transparent? Are you finding that uh, your efforts combined with media efforts is increasing transparency? Well, media definitely a, a, a good way to, <laughs> a, 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 I would say an effective way to get attention mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and uh, enforcing authority to commit to, a, you know, to a appropriate solution in dealing with wildlife plants. Um, but of course, we don't use that as our first option. Mm-hmm. Is like uh, that only be you know this, we use this as the last option when we mm-hmm. when we have no choice. Of course, the first option is that we want to try to work with them. Yeah. Uh, try to get them uh, to 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 come up with a appropriate solution for their wildlife complicated wildlife. But mm-hmm. if we if they refuse or it's not reasonable enough for them to do so, or they you know. They don't do it. They don't agree with us, and we have to find a, uh, I would say, toughest <laughs> measure. The media, yeah. but media is not our first option. Mm-hmm. And they don't. And so, once the media gets involved, then do you find that they clean up their act? Yeah, it's it's usually as as, mm-hmm. as a result that that authority forced to come out and 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 um and and talk about the solution and mm-hmm. talk about what they're not going to do. And <laughs> we have uh, several cases like that. There's uh, one case uh, involving uh, in uh, 102 marine turtles. Mm-hmm. 
uh, in the south of Vietnam with the uh, provincial authority uh, told us that they want to sell these, these marine turtles. Mm. Again, we we talked to them and they did not agree, and so we had to go to uh, to the media. Mm-hmm. That's uh, and of course it only works because they have to come out and say no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to auction off the animal. Were the tur- the turtles were they alive? Oh, uh, they are dead. Mm-hmm. They are dead. But we you know auctioning off a confiscated yeah endangered wildlife is to promote. Uh, is the illegal choice, so yeah. we don't want them to do that. Did they end up uh, just destroying the dead turtles then? Well, that's oh, uh, that's supposed to be. <laughs> 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 we uh, there has been silence, and 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 they still haven't uh, answered our uh, our questions yet, but they commit that they're not going to sell there anymore. So, okay. Well, that's good then. Yeah. And then, um, regarding your campaigns, uh, ENV's launched a new campaign to raise awareness about the rhino horn trade. Um, so can you tell us more about that new campaign? Uh, well, our campaign actually is a very, uh, big, uh, I would say, early stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, since 2005, we have been uh, collecting information about uh, rhino horn trade in Vietnam and, and uh, rhino horn consumptions in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And uh, rhino horn consumptions in Vietnam is a very unique and different from bear buy mm-hmm. or, or, or even tiger bone glue and so uh, what we are what we have been doing is to get the information uh, uh, we have been surveying the traditional uh, Chinese traditional uh, medicine shop to and interviews doctors to find out what the rhino horns in Vietnam use for and you know who what type of people using it mm-hmm. and of course Learning about the uh, trade with, uh, coming in, you know, the rhino horn coming in from our South Africa, and so that after that we figure out, you know, who is the consum- uh, who is the rhino horn consumption uh, consumers and what they use it for, and then we would uh, develop uh, a awareness campaign to target this this group of people of the consumers of rhino horn consumers. So yeah, so our campaign is at very early stage. Mm-hmm, and. Since you've been uh, interviewing and talking to people, like you said, talking to uh, doctors and then trying to find out more who's consuming the rhino horn, is there um, a trend that you can share with us? Like I said, it's very it's a very early stage. We mm-hmm. just did uh, interview like more than twenty uh, shops, oh, uh, okay, medicine shops and and the doctors and. Uh, there's a lot of rumors out there mm-hmm. saying that uh, rhino horns are used for cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we have to 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 do carry more research to figure out is it really rhino horn just for cancer or for anything else, or it just you know. So, so we really, at the moment, we can't really share much about mm-hmm. our finding because we still at the learning stage. Uh, figure out what is what is being used for. Right. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, why it is that uh, in Vietnam there's um, there's this tradition of uh, consuming wildlife uh, not only as a medicine but also as the meat as kind of a health tonic? Can you tell us where that came from? Well, uh, well, I believe that um, the wildlife consumption in Vietnam is, has become a, a part of the culture for a long, long time. Probably did back to the, you know, times of Chinese invasion. As you know, the China invaded Vietnam for a thousand years. So I believe that a lot of Chinese cultural influence, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of 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 of, of uh, Chinese cultures, you know, have been introduced to to Vietnam, mm-hmm. and so uh, so and you know, Chinese 
Chinese they Chinese people they consume wildlife mm-hmm. for various reason for meat yes, or, or or use in traditional medicine. So it's the same in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnamese people believe that if they consume the wildlife, you know, wildlife running around in the forest in nature and wildlife they don't uh, they don't get sick and they they are healthy. And so if they eat wildlife they 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 would become healthy. So for example um eating uh, uh something some part of, of a tiger or or an animal in the forest or you know or eating a leg of a chicken would help them to run faster for example <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so if, yeah so the so people people in, Viet- in Vietnam believe that whatever you eat mm. uh, it would be uh but, you know, it'd be good for that part of your body. For example, if you eat chicken, like it'd be good for your legs. <laughs> if you <laughs> chicken, uh, you know, if you eat a uh, 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 a part of the tiger, tiger leg or whatever would would help you uh, strong as a tiger. Mm. So, because there's a lot of so that's why the Vietnamese not just use wildlife for as a part of traditional medicine, but mm-hmm. they also Thing that wildlife is just good for you in general. Oh, so they so the meat then is even seen, or the flesh is seen as kind of a health tonic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Huh. All right. What can people do to help support the work that ENV is doing? How do people get involved and and help you guys? Well, um, well, for the people outside of Vietnam. Of course, you know, ENV is, is, is a Vietnamese NGO. It's a mm-hmm. very small NGO operating in Vietnam. And we don't, so we don't have uh, a huge department for fundraising or for or, or lawyers or, you know, who help us to, to promoting our work. So it would be very helpful if people out there interested in our work and, and want to support us, you know, would be useful if they can help dedicate their time, helps us with, you know, fundraising and, you know, uh, getting other people interested in in uh, protecting rhinos and other wildlife in Vietnam. That would be great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Quinn, for your time today. It was really great to speak with you. Well, thank you for uh, for your time, too. Thank you for your interest in our work in Vietnam. Oh, you're very welcome. You've been listening to Tackling Wildlife Crime in Vietnam with Quinn Vu, founder of Education for Nature Vietnam. This is Risha Kota Larson with Behind the Schemes. <laughs>